Good morning again, church. I came this morning according to all understanding that I would take the pulpit at this time, and so I stand in obedience to God, who not only asked me to stand before you, but to invite someone else to be with you at this time as well. His name is Elder Randy Skeet. He's a member of this church, and his beloved wife, Sister Mady Skeet, is here with us today as well. I would like to just, before Randy speaks, I'd just like to ask him a few questions. Can we dialogue, my friend? <laughs> Shake my hand, man. How are you? The saints would like to know that you are fine. All right. And... Uh, you have traveled near and far, mm -hmm. and quite recently we've been bombarded with airline accidents. Yes. <clears throat> so, Brother Johnson did indicate to you in the pastor's office, mm -hmm. and members I know are also praying for Randy. Are you praying for Randy? Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So, how's been your travel of late? Oh, quite fine. In February, I was in the Philippines for three weeks. I had three assignments. A very glorious uh, experience I had, and I thank God for it. Then in March, I was in South Africa for three weeks, speaking on two university campuses. That's always an honor to speak to college students to try to reach their minds. Mm -hmm. And I had a very blessed time when they came and they listened, and many made commitments to be baptized. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm leaving tomorrow for Greenville, there's a Greenville somewhere. Um, North Carolina? North Carolina, Tennessee. Tennessee. For a week of prayer, I'll be back next Sunday. And I came in to sit with Medis, and your pastor saw me in the corridor, <laughs> and he said, uh, would I take the pulpit? I said, well, no, you go ahead. Then he said, no, you take it. Then I said, is that a command? And he said, yes. <laughs> so you have to learn to obey the leaders of the church. And that's why I'm in this predicament. <laughs> we certainly appreciate you, Randy. We've oh, been continuing to pray for you. Thank you, thank you. And the church local endorses your mm -hmm. ministry thank global. You. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a final word that you want to say before you get into the word? Well, I'm happy to see my people. I haven't seen in a long time. You still look well. I really mean it when I say I'm happy to see you. God bless you. Stay faithful. And I believe the message I have will apply to you very directly and to those watching via the internet, wherever you are. Thank you very much, Amen. brothers and sisters on the internet and in the pew. Mm. I present to you Elder Randy Skeet. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the fourth and third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, Thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, 
and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good. And all the time. Let's say that again. God is good. And all the time. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let me say it again by way of confirmation. I am pleased to see you. And you all look well. And there are some people who watch you very, very faithfully via the internet. I can't greet everyone personally, but I know there's some people in Kenya who watch you religiously. And I say to them, Karibuni wapendwa mungu awabariki, which means welcome, beloved, and God bless you all. And whatever other country you are joining us, thank you very much. And may God bless you as super abundantly where you are, as we know he will bless us at the Ypsilanti Seventh-day Adventist Church in the town of Ypsilanti, Michigan, in the United States. Who is with us? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? You are, oh, tell us your name. Yeah, I know. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Why is your name not on the membership list? We have to fix that, my handsome brother. God bless you. Look at that smile. He's smiling like noonday. Nice to see you. God bless you. God bless you. I mean that from my heart. I appreciate your constant faithfulness, always in church. Anybody else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May your hand. And you're visiting. Anybody else? All right. If there's a non-Adventist watching via the internet, we are particularly delighted that you've taken time to be with us. And may God bless your life in every possible way. And I mean it. May God bless you so much that you become a blessing to others. I thank God for traveling mercies. Yes, I've heard of plane crashes, but because I only travel to preach, I don't worry. I'm not traveling to go on a safari, which is good. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not traveling to go see the Wolverines play in Indianapolis. I'm not doing that. When I get on a plane, I am only going to fulfill an assignment that God sent my way. So I don't waste time worrying about planes that crash. I pray for the victims' families. I really do. But I sit on that plane and I leave it up to God. Now, there are laws of physics that allow a plane to fly. There's one particular law called Bernoulli's principle. And what that principle says, that when something is passing through a fluid, and the fluid is water or air is a fluid, the pressure under is greater than the pressure above. That causes the, the, the wing or the foil to lift. That's one of the reasons why planes can fly. The pressure and the plane's wings are built a certain way so that the pressure under is greater than the pressure above and that lifts the plane. If you've ever put your hand outside a window of your car while you're driving, you'll notice that your hand tends to go up. Now, yes, that's Bernoulli's principle, but for me, planes that weigh hundreds of thousands of pounds when fully loaded, stay in the air by the grace of God. Can you say amen? amen? We thank Bernoulli for his principle, but I sit on that plane knowing that God keeps that plane afloat. And so I thank him for the great honor of going hither, thither, and yon to speak for him. And I thank him always for the tremendous honor. It is an honor for God to put his hand on you and say, you speak for me. Tremendous privilege, and so all I can do for God is to give you, thus saith the Lord, and keep my opinions to myself. It is now, that what says 12 o'clock, I believe, no? What does it say, 12.15? Is that what it says? There's a glare on there. Okay, I'll release you before or on one. Is that excessive? All right, okay. Do three favors for me. If you have one of these, I'm an old-fashioned preacher. I prefer that you use one of these because they don't ring. Can you say amen? 
they don't ring. They do not disturb God. A Bible does not ring. You don't need to plug it in. Come on, say amen with me. Don't let me feel isolated. Uh, if you have a phone, okay, fine, but you don't need sound to read the Bible. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Do you understand what it is to have God directly put his words in your mouth? He made that promise to Jeremiah. Jeremiah no longer needs it because he's dead. I need it. And so I'm asking God to fulfill that promise for me. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. You know, God is a thinking God, and he's a reasoning God. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. He calls on us to reason. Example I always give, Jeremiah 12, verse 5. No need to turn, just listen. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how then canst thou contend with the horses? God calls upon us to reason. Much of Christianity and understanding the Bible is honest reasoning. If you cannot keep up with a man, how do you intend to keep up with a horse? And so reason, think as you listen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you to God for the joy of seeing my people, my family people here at the Ypsilanti SDA Church. Thank you for those who listen faithfully via the internet who are part of the electronic family. If I've offended you today, forgive me, I pray, Father. And I ask you today, God, for your own glory's sake and for the blessing of your people, that you would put your words in my mouth and in my mind. Help me to listen to the Holy Ghost when he says, say this or don't say that. Help me to restrain the pride that I may obey the Spirit. Father, bless those listening with comprehension, I pray. And at the end of this service, let everyone listening know that he or she has met with God and heard from God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our subject for this morning, the missing part. What did I say? The missing, the missing part. part. Let us go to Matthew 22. We'll read from verse 11. Matthew 22, reading from verse 11. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Matthew's Gospel 1. Matthew was a tax collector, one of the most hated groups in ancient Israel. The Jews hated them because the tax collectors would take more than they needed to take, give the Romans theirs, and they would keep the rest. We call that corruption. It is an old thing. And so the tax collectors were hated. Matthew was one, but he met Christ and became the first gospel writer. Paul, as we read in the Sabbath school, was a murderer of Christians. He did not do it physically, but he consented to their death. And in God's eyes, he was just as guilty. He met Christ, and he went from being a murderer of God's people to a man who wrote a quarter of the New Testament. He used to take life, then he gave his life for the very cause he used to destroy. What am I saying? If you allow Christ to touch you, regardless of the condition of your life, Christ can change you. That is his speciality. Changing people, whether your problem is drugs, alcohol, pornography, it makes no difference what your problem is. The God who created heaven and earth can create a new life in you. Matthew 22, reading from verse 11, the Bible says, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now, you know the story. A king made a feast for his son. And he sent to gather guests. Some made excuses, didn't come. He sent again, and they abused the servants and killed them. The king sent his army destroy those people, then send out again and brought in all what we would call the riffraff, huh? the lowest of the earth. He brought them in to the wedding feast. Now, before the sun could come in, the king had to examine the guests. Of course, 
If you study that, it's a much deeper thing than I'm making it sound. Much, much deeper with regard to the investigative judgment. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now read the next verse for me. For many are called, come on, but few are chosen. Now listen carefully to the word of God. Many are called, few are chosen. Recite with me the best known Bible verse. For God so loved the world, that's many. God, you see, has called the whole world for salvation. Now, he cannot force salvation on you. But God's desire, the desire of his heart, is that every living human being from Adam until this time would be saved. That's his desire. And so in that sense, God has chosen the whole world for salvation. Many are called, but few are chosen. The verse says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world is everybody. But the verse goes on to say that whosoever believeth on him, which is a smaller group than the whole world. Are you following me? So we have the whole world called. Then we have some who believe. So we have called and we have chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. What's our subject? Too slow, too slow. The missing part. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7, we'll read verses 6 and 7, and I want you to read microscopically, read closely. You don't need to be a professor at the seminary to understand God's word. You really don't. You do not need a degree in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic to understand God's word. One of the primary rules of understanding the Bible is to read it closely, concentrate what is it saying. And by the way, read it several times. For Deuteronomy 7, reading from verse 6. Let me say another prayer. Father in heaven, continue to be with my mouth. Please suppress self, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen to be thee, to be a special people unto himself above all people that are where? Upon the face of the earth. Now, we have two groups. We have the earth, and we have a special group. The Lord thy God hath done what? Chosen. What did we read in Matthew 22, verse 14? Many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, of all the peoples on the earth, God chose a special group. And there was a reason for that. Now, despite this narrow choice, it does not change the fact that God so loved the world. Let's go to verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor what? Choose you. We have the word choose again. Because you were what? More in number than whom? Any people. Finish the verse. For ye were the fewest, come on, of all people. Many are called, few are chosen. God tells Moses to tell the Israelites, I am choosing a nation that's the smallest out of the entire world. Let me repeat, God has called the entire world to be saved. He has called them, but God can only call. You and I have to answer. After a while, he chose a special group. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, the chapter, The Call of Abraham, the servant of the Lord writes, I believe it's page 125, paragraph 1, after the dispersion from Babel, what is Babel? The place where that tower was built. The world again, idolatry again became well nigh universal. Listen again. Let me put it in modern English. After God scattered the people from Babel, 
idolatry took over the entire world virtually. Idolatry again became well nigh universal. And so God left the hardened transgression to follow the evil ways while he chose Abraham of the line of Seth and made him the keeper of his law for future generations. Here again, we have of the many who are called a small group chosen. God chose Abraham. But when God chose him, if you read Genesis 12 from verse 1, let's go there. Because we have to keep saying God did not lose his love for the whole world when he chose a few. He chose a few for a reason. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1, our subject, the missing part. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now, no one is called to be a blessing to himself. Well, may I have an amen? amen. <laughs> Do I have to pay for it? No one is called to be a blessing to himself. Amen. Every human being is given life to be a blessing to someone else. Listen to these magnificent words from Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph 2. What did I say? There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold the beauty in blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mist ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth, that it may bring forth and bud. What is the author saying? Everything created was created to serve something else. Now can you say amen? When God called Abraham, God called him not for his sake. God called him, thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so we have the chosen ones, but chosen so that God through them might get back to the hard-hearted larger group. Are you with me? And so many are called, but they refuse to accept God. And God determined, let me call a special family. Choose a family that's the chosen. And hopefully through them, reach the larger world. Many are called. Few are chosen. That's very sad, by the way. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 of God, He will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's, I believe in eternity when God has come back, destroyed the world, gotten rid of sin, and we're living in this world made brand new. There will be eat vacancies in the heart of God forever. Let me say it again. There will be vacancies in the heart of God forever. The vacancy representing those whom God loved and desired to save, but would not let him save them. The same way Christ will carry the scars of the crucifixion throughout eternity. The same way he will be in human form throughout eternity. Visual symbols of the cost of our salvation, so similarly will God forever have vacancies in his heart. Let not that vacancy be yours. 
God desires to save you, let him do it. And so many are called, but few are chosen. Now, let us go to Matthew 24, our scripture reading. Matthew 24, reading from verse 11. You have Matthew 24, reading from verse 11. When you found it, say amen. Read with me, what does that say? And they shall arise, what? False Christ and shall do what? Deceive many. Go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Let's try to identify what many means. Does it mean 5, 6 out of 10? Does it mean, you know, 21 out of 40? What is many? Revelation 12, reading verse 9. Read with me if you don't mind. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, come on, the whole world. Let's go to 1 John 5. Let's read verse 19. Revelation 12, 9 says, the devil deceives the whole world. We have to look at that very carefully. 1 John 5, 19, listen to the apostle John, the closest disciple to Christ by his own choice. There's nothing preventing you from being the closest person to God. Amen. All the amens keep coming from this side. <laughs> What's wrong with that side? <laughs> Listen to me again. There is nothing to prevent you or me from being closest to God. Jesus didn't decide, I will make John closest to me. John chose to be closest to Christ. That's why at the Last Supper, he was leaning on the breast of Christ. And Peter said, ask him who will betray him. Why didn't Peter ask him himself? Because John was so close. And if you read the Bible carefully, John said, which of them will betray you? <laughs> because it won't be me. <laughs> which of them? That's the closeness we must have with God. What book did I send you to? First John chapter 5. Verse 19, do you have that? Yeah. Let me say another prayer. Father in heaven, it doesn't take long for Satan to cause trouble. Give me strength, God. Speak through me. Let me seek your glory, not mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now read that verse with me, verse 19, carefully. What does it say? And we know that we are of God. Come on. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now we have the whole world. First John 5, 19. We have the whole world, Revelation 12, 9. If we take that exactly as it reads, it means no one is saved. But listen to John. John identifies two groups. And we know that we are of God. Now finish the verse. And the whole world. Now, you look at that verse microscopically and you realize we are few. Pitifully few. That's the only reason why John can say the whole world. If we who followed God were many, he couldn't say the whole world lies in wickedness. He would say a few. The whole world overwhelmingly is under the deception of the devil. The whole world. There's a few, or there are a few, who are faithful to God. But I still need to give you the meaning of our subject, which is the missing part. Listen to the words again. Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. Now, every one of the chosen is also part of the called. I confuse you, it's my fault. Every Michigander is a United States citizen, let's, let's assume that. But every citizen is not a Michigander. Are you following me? Are you with me now? Every U.S. citizen is not a fighting Irish from Indiana. Are you with me? So when God called the whole world, the chosen was in the whole world. So the chosen is a part of the many. Are you with me? God desires the many to be a part of the chosen. It's God's desire the whole world would be the few who are chosen. Many are called. Come on, finish it. Few are chosen. What's our subject? Let's go to Revelation 17 and fill in the missing part. It is 25 to 1. The sermon will be short. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Ellen White says, preach short. I mean, she was a prophetess, so she preached for an hour and a half. But I'm not that. So I'll preach short. It doesn't take God long to bless his people. Can you say amen? 
My friends via the internet, I hope you're staying with us and following first by first. What book did I send you to? Revelation, what chapter? 17, what verse? 14. Well, let's read from verse 13. These have one mind and shall give what? Their power and strength to whom? To the beast, which is the most powerful enemy of God in these days. By the way, the beast is a religious organization. Let me tell you something. Listen carefully. The greatest opponents of the gospel, or the greatest opponent of the gospel, is a religious organization. Not the government. The government said, I find no fault in him. The church said what? Crucify him. Let me say it again. The greatest enemy of God today is a religious organization. These have one mind, Revelation 17, 13, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now read 14 microscopically. You read and listen. These shall make war with the lamb. Come on. The Lamb shall overcome them. Why? For he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Stop. He's Lord of Lord and what? King of Kings. Now finish the verse. And they that are with him, come on, are called, uh-huh, chosen, uh-huh. Ah. Because not all the chosen remain faithful. Hmm? Not all the chosen remain faithful. So God goes from many a call, the whole world. Then he has to, he's forced to shrink, you see, to the chosen. From the chosen will come a remnant that are faithful. There's something called a flash in the pan. You've heard the expression? A flash in the pan? make a big noise in you. It's like you see some people cooking in a restaurant, Japanese restaurant, and a big fire and the thing goes out. Some people come to God like that. Big flash in the pan, and the first time a little trial comes, they're gone. Somebody criticizes the shoe or the dress or the stocking that has a, a run in it, and you leave the church. Flash in the pan. Many are called. Most of them flashes in the pan. Few are chosen. They also flashes, but they flash a little longer. Then there are those who endure unto the end. Now, that's the group in which I want you to find yourself. Not to find, you don't find yourself. You have to place yourself. Those that endure to the end. Noah preached. You know, <laughs> we were made in God's image. Let's reason a little bit. 24 to 1, which means we were made to think like God and behave like God. Are you with me? Uh, no, you're not. You're saying that because you're nice. You are. Case closed. All right, case closed. Listen again. And God said, let us make man how? In our image, after our likeness. When a policeman pulls you over, what's the first thing he asks for? A license. What does he do? He looks at your face. Come on. Looks at a license. He does not want to see a variation. I'm always going through security in airports. They look at you and they look at your, 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 your passport or whatever. You must be that person. They, they actually tell you, take your glasses off. You go through, take your hat off. We want to see you. Some countries, you cannot smile when taking a passport photo. It may distort your image. You may look like somebody else, Denzel Washington. So don't smile. Are you with me? Stay serious. Come on, say amen. And so the, the image must be like the real thing. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man, come on, in our image, after our likeness. If Adam had not sinned, his children would have been born in God's image, not his, because he had no image of his own. Are you following me? So now, if God says to us, endure to the end, that must be the way he is. Now, I know I lost you. Because we were made in his image. Whatever he asks of us, that's the way he is. And in the plan of salvation, we see God enduring until the bitter end. 
to save us. So some people say, by the time I was a child, I heard Christ is coming. He hasn't come because God is enduring as long as he can because he's trying to save the very person saying that. Mm -hmm. He is trying to save the man who's making the complaint. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning promises. His promises as some men count slackness. It is not, to, we should not interpret the delay as God being irresponsible with what he says. But his long suffering to us. Word. Come on, what's the word? Long suffering. What does Revelation 17, 14 say? He that what? Endureth, come on, to the end. Or he that is long suffering shall be saved. God suffers long for one reason to save us if you read John 13 don't do it now Christ at the last supper he gave several hints where he's virtually telling the disciples someone will betray me. You read that chapter carefully, you read into four or five hints where he's saying, in other words, he's enduring. He could have come right out and said, that's the guy. Mm -mm. He's giving Judas time, time. In John 6, 70, Jesus said, have I not chosen you 12? And one of you is a devil. Way back in John 6, Jesus knew that Satan, uh, not Satan, uh, Judas was no good. Jesus endured and endured and endured. No one can say to God, there's something else you could have done. And so Revelation 17, 14 says, you know, some people, they hear the message, they hear the word, they hear it, and they do nothing. But God hates sin so much, he cannot endure forever. He has to come. Because they're dead saints waiting for the resurrection. Are you following me? Noah is in the ground waiting for the resurrection. Your father is waiting for the resurrection. My mother is. Adam is. Abel, the first person killed on this earth, waiting for the resurrection. God can't keep waiting for hard-headed people. And so we serve a God who endures to the end. And he says to us, you endure to the end. Many marriages might have been saved if someone decided to endure to the end. Some churches would have been saved from being split up if some members would decide to endure to the end. Many students would become geniuses if the teacher had endured to the end. We give up, finish my words, too quickly. And so the Bible says, many are called. That's a distinction. Mm -hmm. Few are chosen, that's a distinction. But few are still, finish my words, remain faithful. And so Revelation 17, 14 says, And they shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings, and they that are with him are called, that's you. Chosen, that's you. Faithful, is that you. And I hope you can say yes. From the, you know, you've got to make up your mind. Sometimes I read of ministers who leave the church, and I put my head in my hand. And I said, Father, I don't understand how he could leave the church. Leave the truth. Leave Christ. To leave truth is to leave God. It makes no difference to me if you leave the truth and go to the Vatican. To leave truth is is to leave God because God is truth. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. Christ is truth. John 14 6. The Holy Ghost is truth. 1 John 5 verse 6. To leave truth is to leave the family of heaven. You have to make up your mind like Job. Though he slay me. Come on, tell me. Yet will I trust him. I don't care what trials you send. Take my house. Put me on the street. Let me go to the Salvation Army for food. I will not let you go. We've got to say like Jacob. God gave a direct command, let me go. What did Jacob say? No. That's the only time to tell God no when he tells you let me go. 
because he's testing you. And no never sounded so nice in God's ears as when Jacob said, no, I am not letting you go. Finish my words until you bless me. And you must say to God, I am not letting you go. I am not cracking under the pressure until I set foot in the new kingdom. Can you say amen? We must, yes, we're called. That's good. Clap yourself, huh? Yes, you're chosen. That's nice. But are you faithful? Can God count on you? Noah preached 120 years. Hmm? In Genesis 6, verse 3, the Bible says, Yet his day shall be 120 years. Genesis 6, 3. Genesis 7, 6, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters were upon the earth. 600 480, that's 120 years of preaching, and Noah endured unto the end. And so in our scripture reading, Matthew 24, verse 13, but he that shall endure, come on, read with me, unto the end, the same shall be saved. What's our subject? The missing part. I'm finishing. You're part of the called. That's nice. You're part of the chosen. That's nicer. Are you part of the faithful? Here's what Christ said to a young man. And a certain young ruler asked him, saying, Good master, uh, Luke 18, reading from verse 18, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save God, that is, that is one save God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. One. That's all. What a tragedy it is to be lost when you only lacked one thing. Hmm? One. And this is Jesus speaking. On another occasion, he said to a scribe, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Now here's God. You're close. You can smell it. You can taste it. You can hear the river of life flowing. You can hear it. You're not far, says Christ. How can someone that close be lost? You lack one thing, says Christ. One. We just stop working on Sabbath. You lack one thing. Return the tithe. You lack one thing. Stop watching so much TV and study my word. You lack one thing. Put away all that meat. One thing. Hmm? Will you be lost for one thing? And for us today, our one thing is make a decision to be faithful unto the end. But he that shall endure unto the end. Finish the verse. The same shall be saved. How many of you will say with me, Father, no matter what happens, give me the strength to endure with Christ unto the end. Let me see your hand. Ah, God bless you. I mean that from my heart. Stand up with me. Give me the strength to endure unto the end. You know, there's a, a baseball legend called Yogi Berra. And he said, it's not over until it's over. <laughs> Take that attitude towards your spirit. It's not over until it's over. I woke up this morning. I have one more day given to me by God, not to do nonsense, but to surrender to Christ. He gave me today one more opportunity to place myself among those who are faithful. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father, for being long-suffering as verily as you ask us to endure unto the end. You are a God who endures to the bitter end until nothing more can be done to save a sinner. We thank you, dear God, for being long-suffering. And we ask you now in the name of Jesus, open our eyes, dear God, that we may see that despite your long-suffering nature, there will come a day when mercy's door will close. And when mercy's door closes, it never reopens.
Father, while that door is open today, let us make the decision, dear God. Let us say by the prompting of the Holy Ghost, I thank God I am called. I thank God I am chosen. May God give me grace to remain faithful. Father, bless everyone who heard your word in this church via the internet. A double blessing on all their children, dear God. Help us to remain steadfast. Help us to encourage one another. And when you come into your kingdom, Father, save us as that group that remain faithful until the end. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our closing hymn.